All right, um, I'm gonna go and kick us off just to honor everyone's time who joined us um, at the start of the hour. Uh, just to let you all know, this re, uh, user group will be recorded. And so you'll be able uh, to receive an email from us after a few days after the meeting, and it will have the link to the recording. You could share with your peers um, or revisit any of the content that's covered today. So why we are all here. Um, so this is the SLED tug, the state, local, and education lens. Uh, we started this group, uh, it's been many years now, in an intent to pull like-minded people together within the industry. And so you can start to make connections amongst some of your uh, SLED peers and be able to view rich content um, that's applicable versus some of those kind of generic user groups that might be out there. So that's um, why this group has been pulled together. Um, I'm Stephanie Henry. I'm a manager within the business analytics um, lens of our Plant Moran Consulting. We are a tax audit consulting firm. I am one of the, the founders of this user group years ago, uh, Lauren Spear, who is um, also a co-lead. He's not able to join us this morning, but um, he is from CDPHE. Uh, Jamie Kimes, who also helped found this, is with Glassman and Associates. Many of you state local team um, on this call might know who she is. And then I'm going to hand it over to Carissa. Good, good morning, everybody. Carissa Haley. I am the local Tableau rep covering state and local government. So if you fall into that category, I am your person who can help you. Uh, with anything Tableau related. So please don't hesitate to reach out if there's anything I can do. And I believe my colleague, um, Adam Breen, is on as well, who covers everything from an education standpoint. So um, please let us know what we can do to help, but looking forward to this user group today. Perfect. Thank you, Carissa. Um, and just to kind of level set with what we're going to be talking about today, we have our first presenter, Tavio. Uh, joining us um, from CDPHE, and then we'll have Stephen Newcomb join us from CU. We'll wrap up with some talk about uh, Tableau Conference and kind of next steps here within the group. So I am actually going to, well, actually, I'm going to remind you, we have uh, the chat feature is just for color commentary amongst um, those on the call. And if you have a specific question for the presenter, if you'll enter that into the Q&A box, I will help monitor or moderate those uh, throughout our time together. I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to Tavio. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so I'm going to get my screen shared for, uh, for you all. Um, so you guys should be, uh, should be seeing that. Let me move my little control panel over. Um, I'm Tavio Brokey. I uh, work at the uh, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, and I know uh, Stephen's going to come up next and actually show you guys some visuals in Tableau. I'm going to do the boring part of this in the beginning and talk about a bunch of command line code for you all. But I do think it's pretty important stuff. Um, can save some time, can actually get at different data sources, at least that we at CDPHE, and I know others I've talked to in the public sector have trouble accessing and, and using in an automated fashion. And then we're going to talk about how we can loop all this in with Tableau Prep and actually uh, try to bypass some of those uh, more expensive add-ons uh, with Tableau Prep. Although we can't do everything that those add-ons can do, we, we can get some automation that, uh, that they uh, tend to bring us without actually uh, needing the add-ons. So we'll kind of dive into uh, to some of the stuff right here. Um, I gave you pretty much what I think the overview was, but um, we're, we're going to talk about the environments that you need. Um, if this will fit your needs, if it's something that you can use. Um, go over what these command line tools are. Yes, there's two of them. Yes, they are different, but they work pretty much the same way. Um, and we'll get into a little bit of Tableau prep. Um, if we're going through these uh, environmental sections here, and I, I do mention it may not be applicable to everybody or, or everybody's environment, uh, the ending part where we bring in the, uh, the Tableau prep uh, is applicable to anybody who has a creator license for that matter, um, can, can use this automation in some way, shape, or form. So there's something in here for everybody as long as you, you you have access to, to something up here that, that I've mentioned. So stay tuned, even if the, the beginning part here is, uh, is, is not something that, that's going to work within your agency. Um, I do think that it works within most people's agencies. Um, so what do we need to have? Um, Tableau server or Tableau online. This doesn't work with Tableau public, just like most things where we're interfacing with any kind of code or, or, or server um, attributes. We, we can't do it with Tableau public. Um, you also need to have tab command installed on your desktop. It comes on the server. Um, it's a uh, pretty easy install on your desktop, uh, possibly need your, your IT department to, to help you out with the install or not. 
um, but it comes straight from Tableau, straight from the manufacturer. There should be no security issues or, or, or concerns with installing that piece of software. It's created and published by, by Tableau. So uh, I, I feel like it's pretty safe to recommend that you know, we can install that. Um, you'll also need a conventional username and password login for your Tableau server or Tableau online. Google authentication or other external authentication methods don't work with this. Um, however, if your server like ours at CDPHE is configured with Google authentication, you can certainly have a conventional username and password that works in parallel with the, uh, the, the Google authentication. Don't let people tell you otherwise. They tried to tell me otherwise that it was all strictly through Google. That's not the case. Um, so just to, to be aware, you do need that conventional username and password without that external authentication um, for, for these means. And then, of course, appropriate permissions for the account that we create. Um, tab command has a, a far, far reaching ability of what it can do on the server. Um, so depending on what you uh, want to use this for or dive into, you may need to have some elevated permissions. Um, I do a lot of administrative things on uh, on on our Tableau server using tab command. So I do need the you know more server administrative rights to run those. Um, whereas refreshing a workbook just simply needs the ability to refresh the workbook. So appropriate permissions are, are always important for everything, but I just want to call that out there that you know a, a basic view only access is not going to help us too much uh, with, with a command line like this. Um, everybody always likes to ask too, because I've been saying the word command line about 17 times now. How much coding do I need to do? What do I actually need to have on here? And it's really relatively none. Um, so everything's going to be written in batch script. It's a .bat file. You can write that in Notepad, any other text editor. Um, the basics for this, I knew almost none of them uh, when I started learning a little bit of tab command. Uh, and, and, and I can pretty much navigate what, what, what the extent of, of Tableau command line is. Um, the more you know, the more you can do, of course. Uh, but uh, the, the, the good news is I will either give you everything that I talk about today, uh, pretty much script it out for you all. And Tableau does a great job of scripting out all of what you can do with tab command. Um, because I know that I, I'm fine sharing these slides with everybody too. So I'll have some links in here. Um, you guys get the slide deck or whatnot, feel free to, to go click on them or you, know, you can Google and find this stuff pretty simple too. It's Tableau's help, uh, help sections. But gives you a list of all the commands, everything you can do, explains them all, explains all the different versions of them. Um, it, it's a pretty uh, pretty robust help document that's there. It's where I learned everything that, that I'm doing today is pretty much from their help documents. Um, and again, like I mentioned, you can do a lot of server admin tasks in here. Of course, we're not gonna really talk about those too much, but I wanna call out though that this tool I think is primarily used for automating some, some server admin tasks. And we're gonna kind of expand that role onto how some um, non-admins can use this, more analyst roles can, can utilize these functionalities here. Uh, so if you do have a basic understanding of, of that batch code, you can do a lot more um, in preparing some of these files and moving some things around. I do call out two things on here that the only two things I think that are, are, are super important to remember, and that's that spaces are kind of the bane of our existence here. Um, I try never to use spaces. I just use underscores for everything when I need a space. Um, but in batch code, though, if you do have spaces and things, remember that you need to, quote, escape the spaces um, or else you're going to end up uh, with, with, with code that's just going to bomb. The escape code is a uh, percent sign, percent sign 20. Um, really, you can just look that stuff up. Microsoft help documents will, will get you some basic batch coding. The other piece we need to know is CD, which is to change the directory. And that's because we're going to be moving around different directories on our computer through this code. Um, and CD is the only other command that we really need. So if you don't use spaces, the only external piece of code you need that's not written in Tableau's help document is two letters, that's CD. So that's going to be very minimal coding that, that we actually need. Um, and I can show you, and I will show you guys how all this stuff uh, ultimately works. So I've mentioned these couple things here, tab command, command line utility, but what are they? And they are different. Um, I, I, I'm not exactly positive myself why they are totally different. Uh, I, I, I theorize that the command line utility came before tab command, but I would let somebody else, of course, answer that if you were curious about the history of it. But I'll give you at least a small overview of what the two of them are. Uh, tab command is more of that uh, full I call it full stack command line interface. Um, we can automate site admin tasks, we can refresh data. Uh, we can actually use it to generate some, uh, some different reports too. Uh, you do need to have it installed locally on your computer. Uh, link is right there too, if you want to install it. So we can get the slide deck, install it. Um, I do recommend the same version as a server. Of course, I use older versions because I just don't keep them updated. But as our server updates, I've had no problems. I've used the 20, I think it's 
like 2019 version of this and it still works fine for me uh, and this stuff really doesn't change that often so you're you, it's it's not as dynamically changing as tableau desktop is every version doesn't have a, a, a new tab command for you um, relatively though the years i've been using it it hasn't changed at all now which i kind of like about it once you once you get your your processes in place there they're pretty solid with that. then we have this command line utility um, pretty much the exact same thing as tab command, but of course different. Um, we're going to call it differently. It's located in a different directory for you. Uh, and this utility primarily is used to refresh extracts of our published data sources, not to do any kind of administrative tasks with. Um, thus, you also need no extra installation um, or anything else that actually is installed when you have Tableau Desktop installed. You can call this. Um, we write actually, we can use the exact same text file, the same uh, same bat file that we're using for any tab commands to also call this. Really, it functionally works the same way. This is where that change directory aspect will come in. And I know I'm talking around on this, we're going to look at the actual code that, that, that generates all this and what we can do with it. Uh, but functionally, though, it all works the same way. It all works through batch coding. So we can write just one script and move back and forth between the two command line utilities that, that we need. Um, so kind of the, the, you know, what can we do with all this here? Why you guys are all here? Why you should pay attention to this? Um, you know, of course, I got to call out that first bullet there. Management of the server, maintenance, other administrative tasks, things we're not going to talk about today because I, I, I don't, I, I wasn't gearing this toward a bunch of uh, site admins. Um, but the three bullets that are left there, though, I think are, are, are three cool things we can do with it. We can do a lot more. Um, but we can refresh data from uh, what I call non-server data sources. So Excel files, SAS files, SPSS files, things on a common drive, for example. Um, we at CDPHE have a lot of data sources that exist on common drives and CSVs and Excel files, in SAS output files, things of that nature. Um, and one of the problems that we, we tend to have though is our server has trouble refreshing off of those common drives or off the files that are on our local computer. And so our automation tends to break. Even if I run my SAS code every day and I produce a file on my computer, it never hits the Tableau server. It stays on my local machine. I have to republish my viz to, to get that to update. Um, so we're going to talk about how we can actually bypass um, you know, the lack of automation. there. Um, the second bullet point there is, uh, I think, more of an advanced technique of that, though. It's automating report generation. So pretty much what you can write in, the, in, in some batch code is to cycle through a list of filter options and then tell Tableau server to print a PDF of each of those automatically. So if, for us here at the health department, I use that to generate 64 county leveled reports automatically. I have a viz that's set up, uh, the filter across there is just for county and my code goes through and through URL feeds in each of the county names and prints the PDF report. So I can generate my 64 reports for the counties automatically without having to go and cycle through the filter options and download the PDF. Uh, any of you guys, though, who work in school districts, I saw a couple of you on here, though, you undoubtedly, though, have more than 64, especially if you're from uh, some of the metro areas or uh, even up in Boulder Valley, too. Uh, so that's really kind of helpful. I feel like if you've got a large school district, you know, 100 and some schools on there, pretty easy to, to cycle through and just let the code run instead of having to, to download each of them automatically. And the last one, I think the one that's probably most interesting to everybody because it's a little bit newer, is automating um, our, our prep flows and updating our data sources without having a server add-on uh, for prep, which, you know, for us here in, in, in local state government education and things, budgets are always tight. Um, server add-ons are expensive, and I'm not at all claiming that I can do everything that the server add-on can do because it certainly can't, but I can do one of the big things, which is automating those flows and actually making Tableau prep uh, Tableau prep builder on our on our machines, um, something that really can contribute to automation uh, in, in, in a true form. So we're going to dive into all these kind of things here, except uh, I do apologize, the automated report generation, I wanted to kind of leave there as a little nugget to people's heads. Feel free to reach out to me if it's something that you guys feel like is, is something you could use in your agency and, and, and you want to, to get started with it. Um, I feel like a basic understanding of tab command and, and how we, we utilize the command line is important before we dive into that. And I don't want to overload people with how that is um, because there is a lot more batch code that goes into how that's written. Um, and I, I, again, I, I promise to be minimal coding for this. So if that's something that's interesting to you, reach out to me. We can talk privately. Um, but that's about all I'm going to say about the, the report generation. So local data refreshes here. Um, seems like it should be something that's easy, but it presents a pretty big challenge to us, at least here at CDPHE and, and with people that I've talked to. Um, so I look at conventional Tableau refreshes on the server as pulling data. Tableau server goes out, pulls data from somewhere into it. Um, and here at CDPHE, uh, that doesn't really work too well for us when they're not on servers. 
Uh, if everything's on a server, we can open up firewalls and we can pull data from servers all day long. Uh, that's not necessarily uh, a pain point. But any of those non-server files, any SAS files, R files, SPSS files, CSV files, anything like that, if they're on common drives, on a local machine, anywhere like that, we can't automate, we can't automatically refresh from them. We can set it up and it'll fail every time on our server. Uh, a lot of that's due to the, the account authentications that Tableau server needs to reach down to our local machine. Uh, it's just not something that, that, that our IT is ever going to allow to happen. And I know that, that that seems to be a pain point for a lot of people. Um, so if we can't schedule automated refreshes, especially from uh, statistical software outputs, it really does kind of limit what we can automate, especially because we can automate things like our R code, our SAS code, things like that to run and generate these files for us. But if we can't automatically refresh our visualizations, we can't share that data amongst our, our, our partners, our peers, our management, without having to physically be at the computer, uh, set a timer on my calendar to, to update the, the Tableau uh, visualization on our server. And that really, I think, breaks what is the, the, the good uses of this, though, that ability for our leadership, our management, our peers to go and, and look at data, see data when they want to, not have to rely on, on someone like myself or, or anybody else who's here to be pushing it up there every day at 12 o'clock. Uh, that way, you know when the refresh happens. So uh, that's been a really big pain point for us. Because I know um, a lot of our, uh, I work in immunizations, a lot of our immunization work, our communicable disease work, which I, I partner a lot with, uh, with that branch, it's all in SAS. It's a lot of SAS code that runs. The CDC produces a lot of great SAS code for people to run automatically. They do it in R as well too, and we have a lot of R code that runs. And this really does tend to, to, to break what is the, I feel like the next step after you run that SAS code, that R code is getting things in a visual for people to see. Um, so if it's not server-based or it's not Google-based, Google Sheets will also uh, refresh automatically, at least in our server environment. Um, you know, the automation breaks at this point. And so a lot of people have been leveraging uh, Google Sheets very heavily, um, trying to upload things to warehouse servers at the end of their SAS code. And you know, it, it's, it's starting to use things that like they're not designed to be used for. It's creating a lot of extra steps. Do we actually need those extra steps? Uh, and of course, if the answer was we do, I wouldn't be here. So the answer is kind of obvious. Um, no, we don't need those extra steps. Uh, we can use what I call an unconventional refresh where we push data to a server instead of asking the server to pull it. Um, so kind of my, my way of looking at it is that normal process. Uh, Tableau server relies on pulling data. Process I've created pushes data up to the Tableau server because my local machine or some of my warehouse servers have firewall access to both ends. I can upload the Tableau server, and I can also grab things from my common drive using my computer or using a, um, I also have a warehouse SQL server that I create this in a true automated fashion on. Uh, it's always on. So I can schedule these things through task scheduler and I can create permissions for those users to always access common drives. Um, so it really does work like true automation at that point. Um, at the end of the day though, this looks like a conventional Tableau refresh. Uh, it really works the same way that, that everything else does. It's just done through a different means. Um, it really lets us get at those localized data sources uh, in, in an automated fashion. Um, so I kind of go through here and, and I created some of these slides though with the idea that most people will watch this and they won't be sitting here with the demo that we go through and be able to ask questions. So I tried to stick as much code on here as I could for us. Um, I will also kind of walk through some of this too, but this way it's also in the slide deck if people just download that slide deck and don't watch the whole video, they'll actually have all the code that they would need to, to compile this together. Um, so refreshing the data sources, I feel like kind of works uh, uh, through, through two different pieces of code, getting us to the correct directory, that's that CD idea. Um, and again, you can kind of tell here, my, my uh, I, I use the uh, 2021.4, I believe, is where we're at on our server, but my uh, tab command is still back on 2020. Again, the older ones still seem to work just fine for me. Um, and all we're really going to do here is we're going to refresh a published Tableau data source. So I load up a data source like an Excel file, a SAS file, et cetera, in a Tableau desktop, and then I publish it as a data source to the server. That's the only manual step we really need to do is just to get that data source up on the server. Um, you could do it through. Um, command line like that and actually publish that data source. I just think it's easier while well, you're doing it in Tableau desktop because chances are you're wanting to work with the data source anyway. You might as well load it up there and start working with it and, and publish it to your server when, when you're ready. Um, also too, I, I know people like to uh, create calculated fields in their data sources first prior to publishing it up to the server and don't just like to stick the raw CSV file up there. Uh, so I do skip that step in there because I, I personally like to do that first too and, and actually look at the data source before I just stick it up on our server. 
Um, so I, I do assume that we have a published data source on the server um, as, as I'm walking through this. Um, but essentially all we're doing now is just telling Tableau where to refresh things from, uh, what the server name is, username and password. And of course I've used UNP. Uh, I have username and passwords. I'm, I'm unfortunately not gonna share them with you all. Uh, you guys don't get that from me, I'm sorry. Um, if you have sites and projects, you need to specify those. Um, some people just have a site, they don't have a project, so you don't need to specify project. This is where some of the knowledge of how your server is configured will come in, and those help files will walk you through any possible um, additions to this code that you may need. Um, the last thing you need is the data source, and that is the data source name on your Tableau server, uh, and then the original file, and that's the only localized pass, uh, pathway that we, uh, that we have. Everything else is from our, our Tableau server. Um, the only important thing I want to call out, though, is that this is uh, obviously from my desktop, uh, so I have the files right over here just to access for you guys, and I don't have to worry about uh, my common drives going down. But if you do anything on a common drive, or you do anything that's not locally on your, you know, pretty much your C drive on your computer, um, please make sure to use that, that UNC pathway. If you're unsure of how to generate that, you can Google it pretty quickly. Um, and, and there's actually a really easy way to have Microsoft pull it out for you. Just be sure to use that pathway because as you've mapped a drive as a drive X or drive Y or drive Z, that's just for your local machine to know that that's what you wanna call that common drive. Everybody's J drive can be different, for example. Um, not sure if that's common knowledge for everybody or not, um, but for some people that, that I've talked to, that's a, a mind blowing idea that my J drive is different than your J drive. Uh, your H drive is different than my H drive and I don't have an I drive. So, just understand that there is a, a, a universal pathway that you should be using if there's a shared drive. Make sure you use that universal pathway. Things will fail. If not, you'll be a little confused as to why they're failing because the pathway looks like it works great in Windows Explorer, but doesn't work in the code. Um, so essentially, all we're doing is we're telling Tableau to refresh the data source that I've named Tug Excel Data. Great name, I know. Um, from the file on my computer, it's Tug Excel Data. Again, wonderful names for that. Um, usually, if I instigated this refresh from Tableau server, it fails. This method, though, of pushing it up will actually work for us. Um, and then what we can do is we can move away from that command line utility. We can switch over to tab command. And if we were using an extract on any of our workbooks, we can actually have tab command then refresh the extract as soon as that data source was updated. Uh, do you need to have an extract? No, it could have a live connection to your Tableau data source. Um, but I know a lot of us like to run extracts, especially for published data sources. They tend to increase the speed just a little bit at times. And I also want to make sure that I show everybody that we can go full circle. There are no limitations between live and extract connections for this to work. Um, and again, we can write it all in, in the same bit of code. Um, all we're now doing is, you know, moving our directory over to our, our uh, command line utility here, our tab command, um, logging in again, and then writing a little bit of uh, refreshing of that extract. Uh, it's a little easier on the code for refreshing the extract than it is for refreshing the data source uh, because everything is happening on Tableau server and doesn't require any kind of pathways from my local machine, anything of that nature. Um, so now my favorite part of the time here is uh, where I get to kind of show you guys how all this stuff works a bit. Uh, so I'm gonna be dragging over a couple different files um, and you have to pardon me here as I get them all set up for you though. Um, so I have my Tableau, um, uh, data file here, and I'm hoping you guys can all see it. All I've done is put a couple years in a value column in here. I mean, it's the simplest thing in the world. Um, so I wanted to show you guys that there's there's seven rows of data and, and a header row that appears there. Um, and I will happily share my uh, markdown version of this here. I've got a lot of comments in here that kind of walk us through what, uh, what all is happening. I know it's a little hard to see, but I'll give this file to Stephanie too. There's no, uh, no, no PHI, no anything. My username is U and my password's PW. Um, obviously I've taken that stuff out for, for any of this, but here's all the code kind of written to where it will work. Um, I am gonna run that file, um, but I'm gonna run the one that uh, actually has the username and password. I just wanna show you guys kind of how things pop up at least on, uh, on, on my screen and then tend to work. Um, so it shows you here, it refreshes our data source first. So those are seven rows are uploaded just like we had the seven rows that are there. Um, then it's going to come in and schedule an extract uh, refresh to happen uh, on, on the workbook. So at this point in time, anything that was in that Excel file has now hit Tableau server, and I've scheduled a, a refresh on the workbook that, that I've got connected to it so that I get all seven rows of, of data. To prove that this kind of works, though, let's add another row. Let's add 2022 and go with 65 for it. All I'm going to do is save the Excel file, 
and then uh, I'm going to rerun that exact same thing I just ran. Now the refresh isn't going to work. It's going to tell you that uh, one of those has already been scheduled. It's not going to refresh it again. Uh, that's because I've done this so quickly right here, um, but that's kind of to, to be expected. So now you see eight rows of data uploaded. I uh, kind of showed you that little um, quick thing. Actually, our server's working a lot quicker than I thought. So it, it did already refresh and, and schedule that refresh for us. Um, if we wanted, you know, any kind of, uh, I guess, further proof of it, I could pull the uh, could pull the viz up now where I've got uh, 2022 stuck in there and my, my 65. Um, whereas, you know, before that, that wasn't the case. You could see eight rows instead of seven rows. So anything I've changed in there gets popped up there. Um, so just wanted to kind of show you guys how that works. It's pretty seamless, uh, works pretty much automatically, and you get success or failure messages that, that pop up for you to know. Um, I think that's pretty easy right there. Um, refresh completed and succeeded. It kind of can check yourself right there. Exactly. Thank you, Steve. Thumbs up. We're good. Done. Um, and, you, and, and you can be kind of secure in knowing that, that all those things have happened just like they would happen if you scheduled them on the server. Um, so, oops, I went, I went too far back. There we go. So, Wanted to kind of show you guys that demo. I'm happy to include the uh, uh, marked down uh, text file uh, to Stephanie, and she can kind of disseminate that if you guys wanted to see how the uh, how the code actually runs in there, um, or have something to to hit off of for your own environment. Uh, I'm more than happy to share that as well. Um, but I do want to take just a moment here, though, and talk about what we can do with Tableau Prep and how we can kind of incorporate this into Prep. Um, I am not a huge prep user. I'll be very honest with that. Um, I have a warehouse SQL server and that lets me do most any data manipulation in there. And I like my SQL skills a little bit better than I like my Tableau prep skills. Um, so that tends to, to be where all of our data comes from, flows into, and a lot of our processes hit. Um, but I am getting more and more into, uh, into Tableau prep, especially now that I have ways to kind of automate some things that uh, previously were pain points for me that I had no issues on with my SQL server. Um, so just a real quick overview of what Tableau Prep Builder is in case anybody didn't know what it is, though. Um, it's a really easy way to do a lot of calculations, rearranging, formatting a data prior to actually working with it in Tableau. Um, I think the biggest thing that I have enjoyed about it is I can do all of those type of table calculations and things. And then when I get my data source, it's more like a flat file data source. Um, so I'm not trying to do table calculations on table calculations. I don't have to write code around all of those type of issues where um, I have a fixed function, but I want to use a running sum inside of it. I don't have to write larger code to do all that. Um, Tableau Prep's largely just like most of uh, Tableau desktop is, point and click, point and shoot like that. Um, it does make it a little bit easier for people with, uh, with minimal coding experience to be able to wrangle data together and get it ready for Tableau. It comes with all the creator licenses too. Um, so I think for most everybody, that's kind of what we're all getting nowadays is Tableau creator licenses. Um, the only uh, the only big thing though is when you have the they call them flows, which is your your data flow. At the end of the flow is uh, how to you know export your data, um, and of course this can happen on your server with server add-ons to where you can refresh these Tableau uh, prep flows automatically, uh, just like you can refresh extracts on. Uh, but we're going to run into the same problem, except kind of two problems this time. The server add-on is pretty costly, at least for us here, us here at CDPHE. Um, and with Tableau Prep being, I feel like, underutilized at CDPHE, we haven't really been able to justify the cost of it. Um, that's where all the automation takes place. That's where the refreshing of those flows works. Um, but even with that add-on, we're still going to have the same problem we talked about before. Any localized data sources, any SAS output files, any statistical files like that still aren't going to be able to be reached. So that still runs into that, that, that same underlying issue though, of really only being able to hit off of uh, you know, server-based files. And if I can hit off server-based files, why don't I just do my data manipulation on the server and save myself a whole ton of time? At least that would be my, my questions to ask. Um, and I feel like that's why this kind of comes in and, and creates a unique solution where we really get, uh, I think the best out of Tableau Prep. Um, so when we're done with Tableau Prep or we're done with doing all of our data flows in there, uh, we export a data source uh, and we actually can configure Tableau Prep to export to Tableau Server at the end of it and, and publish a file. And if I open up Prep Builder and I run my flow through Prep Builder, it will upload to my server, even with Google authentication. I have to authenticate it, but it'll certainly work and publish that data source. But if you guys haven't seen a theme of mine here, it's not opening up any program to get something to happen. Um, I don't like that I have to open up Tableau Prep and click run the flow in order to get my data source to upload. Uh, I, I'm, I'm an, I like automation. I like things just to happen. Um, so what can we do to, to kind of get around that? 
If we try uh, to do anything automatically through Tableau Prep, we're going to fail with any non-user name-based authentication. So any Google authentication, any, 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 any type of Windows authentication, anything of that nature, though, is going to bomb because it's not going to be able to authenticate. And you'll come back with, uh, with an error message. So that doesn't really get us an automated solution, even, even with the add-on. Um, so what I've kind of come up with, though, is we can leverage a lot of what we just talked about before, where we prove that we can take local files, put them on our server with no additional means except one text file. Um, so can we do the same thing with Tableau Prep? Can we get Prep to run their a flow, export data, and then if we export the data, we've already proved that we're solid as far as putting up the Tableau server. All we need is for Prep to be able to run and export data. And again, I wouldn't be asking the question, nor would I be here if it wasn't, yes, of course we can do it. So prep can actually work from the command line too. Um, and this I actually feel like is a lot easier than anything else, probably because prep is, is you know, the newer of all the things we're talking about. I'm really happy that Tableau has kind of incorporated some of the command line stuff directly into prep. Um, so I wanna show you guys here. I have a, uh, I've saved myself a Tableau flow. Um, it's probably the easiest flow you'll ever make. It's the uh, default test one that Tableau has. I changed absolutely nothing to it because I just wanted something that would work really easily. Um, so if I come in here to what my uh, what my text file is, it is one line. And compared to everything else you guys saw, this is probably, again, the simplest and easiest code that's there. One thing I want to call out, though, is what we're actually looking for and running is another .bat file, another .bat file. This one, however, though, comes straight from Tableau. Uh, it's, it, it's their own. That's why I mean they've actually integrated being able to use this into Tableau Prep, which I think is really cool. All we have to specify is where my flow is and Tableau Prep will do the rest of it for us. So I'll show you guys that here in, uh, in, in just a moment, but I wanted to show you what that line of code down here actually does. Um, and I kind of talked through what this does, um, where we're just calling the flow, having it save. Prep's never going to open, never going to do anything like that. Um, the only thing I want to call out, though, is that I broke this down into two separate files, more because I've given this in a part one and a part two presentation before. So that's kind of how they were, were set up. I also too want to call out how they all work individually because you don't need all three of these to work together. Um, some people won't be using Tableau Prep, so I wanted to separate them that way, but you can absolutely create one bat file that will do all three of these things that we talked about. And I think you guys have seen how easy that is to, to kind of combine them. Um, in my world, I have a warehouse SQL server. Others may have Oracle or other kind of servers, though. If you can install applications and you can use Task Scheduler there, those servers, I consider them to be always on unless, you know, IT is doing maintenance on them. So when you schedule things like that, it really truly is automation. Your laptop can be off and they will still run and they will still work. Um, otherwise, you know, laptop has to be on uh, in order for the task scheduler to, to kick on and actually run them. Um, so I guess it's not true automation unless you have something that's always on. Um, but again, we, we get we get a lot closer. And if you have any environment like that where you have a even if it's just a computer that's always on in your office, here you go. Um, but without further ado, it's demo time again. My favorite time. I want to run this Tableau prep file here for you, show you what it does. Um, so you'll see here it kind of goes through, um, finds my flow, loads the flow, creates everything in the temp directory, and you'll watch here too. It's going to go through the flow and in uh, in the in the folder over here to the right, once it's done, it's going to stick us a CSV file. Uh, that was my chosen um, output in Tableau Prep was to export it as a CSV file, um, because again, we've already proven that we can pick up any of those local files and push them up to the server. Um, so there we go, load of the flow. Oh, and there's no errors, amazing, because Tableau created the flow for me and I know it works really well. Um, so everything's running, and I think you guys just noticed something new popped up here, annual regional performance. I put my initials at the end of it so that you know it's something that I just made right now, and I didn't magically just make that appear. Um, but that's the output right there of, of my flow, the CSV file to this directory, and that's where it outputted it. So I could continue writing, uh, you know, my... I could continue writing code in here to pick up the file that was just um, exported like we did before and push it up to Tableau server and then refresh my extracts. So I've essentially now automated prep on your local machine without having any add-ons for your server, without spending any kind of money, without doing anything else besides writing a basically small text file. Uh, that's kind of what my wrap up here is, you know, automation should always be our goal. As much as we can automate with no human interaction with it, saves us all time. Uh, and, and I think, you know, 
creates a, a more sustainable product. Um, Tableau's got great automation tools. I will say they are built for automation. Um, it's our firewalls, it's our permissions, um, it, it's our budgets that kind of get in the way of using that out of the box automation. Um, but I think that we can combine some of the, the, the tools that are given to us though to create that automation on our own. It's just about kind of knowing how to navigate that. Um, so I think it's a fairly simple um, idea to automate, you know, a, a, a prep flow like that from square one to updating of this. Uh, I, I think also really for us that that last bullet is kind of the takeaway for me, though, is this this technique really widely opens up what data sources we can use. And it really brings that statistical software outputs back into the realm of automation in Tableau, which at least for us, the health department is really key to being able to do because a lot of our stuff is done in SAS, a lot of it's done in R, and being able to automate then the visual component of that. Uh, I think is 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 really the the next step for us. Um, so that's my that's my soapbox for the day here. Um, I do appreciate you guys uh, paying attention, listening, watching, whatever the the case might have been for you all. Um, I know it's uh, a bunch of uh, command line batch code like that, and Stephen's going to give us a much you know more uh, energetic type of presentation. I'm sure I've seen some of his visuals, so I'm excited to check those out. But no, thank you guys for your attention. Any questions you got, feel free to email me um, or you know throw them up in the chat and I'll, I'll answer them live as best I can. Javier, thank, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. And now I wanna, you know, once this meeting ends <laughs> and as soon as you send over some of those collateral pieces is to get in there and try that out. That was amazing. Um, and so kudos to you and I thank you immensely for sharing, uh, willing to share this content in your files and the code um, with everyone. So uh, truly yeah. a blessing to have um, in this user group. So we appreciate you. So I don't see any questions right now sitting in oh. the Q and A. Um, I've got I've got one though. Steve Steve Steve's got a question for us though. Um, and 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 you're right though. What 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 is a dot what is a bat file a dot bat file? It's a yeah, it's a Windows batch file. And so all it's doing is just you know a, a bunch of uh, essentially just Windows commands batched together. Um, the, the, the extension is .bat, so I just call it a bat file. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just calling Windows command line to, to run a bunch of code for it. Um, if you make it in Notepad, for example, and you save it as a text file, just change the extension to .bat and it runs no problem. It's one of those few times where you can change the extension and it actually does what you want it to do, whereas usually we change the extension and it screws something up. Um, yeah, it's like the one time where that's actually applicable. So I have a question off of that. So a lot of the yep. users on the call or will be listening to this uh, post meeting. Um, in working in the public sector space, there's a lot of lockdown security. You don't have access to sure. typical, you know, ability to download new material onto your machine, that lens. So in the uh, process you just described in the bat file and the tab command, are there any kind of security regulations, um, any hindrances that sure. the peers on this call might run into and, and what would be some coaching around that? Um, sure, so there's probably two that you might run into. Um, one tab command is a, an external application that we need to install. However, it comes directly from Tableau. It's created by them, manufactured by them. So I, I, I can't see once we presented that, once you present that to IT, present that to whomever it is that, that you need to. I mean, it is a straight from the manufacturer add-on. There's no blog, there's no anything like that. We're not going outside of the software manufacturer. It's kind of like, you know, a, a, an add-on for Windows um, type of thing. It comes from Microsoft in that sense. Um, I can't see where that's an untrusted source where we're getting a piece of software that's from any you know, third party or anything like that. So approvals, as far as that's concerned, should be fairly easy since it's straight from the manufacturer. Um, it's actually included in the, when you install Tableau server um, out there, it's actually included in the server itself. It's just an add-on for the local desktop. Um, I, I wouldn't even be surprised at some point in time, this just gets rolled into the installation. Um, the Tableau command line utility that I mentioned, which really just has that one purpose of refreshing now, the extracts, that's built into Tableau desktop. You couldn't not have that if you tried. So I, I, I would almost be expecting that as this stuff uh, gets more integrated, like you saw Tableau prep, it's built into Tableau prep at this point. Um, it seems like that, that it, really, it really seems like that, you know, this, this should be built in at some point in time. But I would just talk with, uh, talk with the powers that be who can make installations on your computer, show them where it comes from, show them the trusted source like that. 
Um, and, and I think that really gets over most of the most of the barriers. Um, IT may need to vet it or whatnot, but I can't see where that comes back as being any sort of, uh, you know, issue since it comes straight from the manufacturer. The other issue you might run into, though, is actually executing those bat files, depending on your, your local permissions on on your computer. Um, really, the coaching around that, though, is that uh, what these are, what they do. And, and why we need them. Uh, and that was kind of the appeal that we made beginning of COVID to at least our IT was uh, just getting access to Windows Task Scheduler was uh, you know, a, a, a burden on us. Um, but explaining what we're doing with it, that it's just to create automation, how it works seems to kind of smooth everything over, understanding that you know, uh, government IT works slow uh, was probably my, my, my biggest challenge. Um, I wanted to write these things and just go because I, I had an understanding of how they worked. But I think just working with uh, working with people, understanding that this is probably going to be new to your IT department too. It was new to ours when I brought this up, and just understanding that they may need some time to look over some stuff and and, and to go through their proper channels. Um, it's not uh, it's it's not out of the box type of stuff, even though it pretty much comes in the box. Um, it's not it's not stuff that they were at least used to on our end. So I think you know the the suggestions really really that I have as far as coaching is just to just to explain what this is, what we can use it for, um, and it it really allows us to do our job a lot better. Um, we shouldn't be standing in the way of that kind of automation. Perfect. Great response. It looks like uh, Stephen entered another question into yeah. the chat. Yeah, PowerShell like that. I don't have anything on hand for a uh, command, uh, like a compare and contrast, but just uh, having done some stuff in PowerShell though, the, I think biggest difference is tab command is its own sort of command line application that's there. And so there's, uh, when I, I linked a few things in here for some of the, Oh, uh, gotta get back to it. Let's see if I can open it up. For you. But those commands are going to be um, exclusive to tab command. You, you know, even if you write it in PowerShell, PowerShell is not going to know how to do any of the things that are, are listed in this help document here. Um, all of them. The first thing to start with is tab command, as they call that. You know that that application. Um, so I think that in PowerShell, you might be able to, um, you know, flash over and call the, 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 the tab command. Um, Cause I know, I know you can call command line interfaces from PowerShell. So you might be able to do this instead of in a, a notepad, um, you know, wrapped up in, in, in a much larger process, which would be pretty cool to do. Um, my, my, my whole goal was to try to get this down to the smallest, you know, least common denominator where we all have as much of this as possible. Uh, one piece of software from the manufacturer and notepad. But absolutely, Stephen, though, you, you should be able to integrate PowerShell pretty well into this as long as you have tab command. PowerShell just doesn't make up for, you know, something like add users. Um, there's no way it's going to add users to uh, the Tableau server for us without having tab command. But you should be able to do all this calling tab command commands. That's a funny way to say it um, from PowerShell. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't have anything on hand though. But uh, if you, uh, if you, if you check this out though, and, and you're a bit of a PowerShell user, I'd love to see how those two can can get rolled together a bit more. <laughs> if you got time, you know what I mean. It's it's that that. Steven, no, no, no pressure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But say I'll do my best with my like super, you know, novice knowledge of all of these things. I'll <laughs> see what We're I can do. We're all learners. <laughs> yep. You're all learners. All right. I don't see any other questions, but if you think of something, go ahead and pop them in there. Tabio can get to them later. Or uh, again, we'll be able to share the content and information. Um, and he has graciously offered uh, to chat with you um, if you have any further questions. On that. So at this point, we're going to uh, switch over and we're going to have um, Stephen present. He is from uh, CU and he will be talking to us about driving clinical revenue through data relationships. I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, Stephanie and Tavio. Thanks again for that great presentation. That was really cool and really helpful and a lot of cool stuff that I didn't know. So, so, so thanks for that. 
Um, all right, so jumping in a little bit here, um, um, uh, just a little bit about me. My name is Stephen Newcomb. I'm the Division Administrator for Gastroenterology and Hepatology. What I'm going to present to you today has a lot to do with how we were able to drive uh, clinical revenue through really, really great data and really, really great data visualizations, courtesy of Tableau. And I have to say um, is that with this presentation, a lot of this stuff may not be directly applicable to you in your specific situation, but I'm hoping a lot of the tools, a lot of the techniques and a lot of just the overall visualization might help kind of spark some interest uh, um, for you. But more specifically, I think one of the cool things about this presentation is, is how I was able to utilize Tableau relationships and ta Tableau desktop. So having that said, I did save that for the end of the presentation, just like any good superhero movie. Um, 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 the most exciting things is gonna happen towards the end. All right, so before I begin, um, the story and data you're about to see is true, but the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Um, um, and, and the other thing is we will be talking about uh, clinical revenue and clinical data. So my other disclaimer here is that this presentation and dashboard does meet HIPAA compliance and no individual patient information will be shared. Um, and with that in mind, just to set the stage a little bit, is really what we're gonna see here is in this presentation is, is I built this dashboard um, to help us really review and analyze our overall clinical income and clinical data. Um, I did rename this, uh, uh, this particular clinic. I called it the superhero clinic. And I just wanna give you a little bit of background as it relates to the superhero clinic and also uh, a little bit about clinical billing overall. So. First and foremost, this is definitely an advanced clinic. This is not your primary care provider. This is not somebody that you see if you have, um, um, if you have some sort of bad migraine or just need headache medicine or something like that, is the patients that go to this clinic have some pretty advanced and some pretty some pretty complex problems. Generally speaking, you don't you don't want to go to this this particular clinic because if you do, it means that you've been through it means you've been through a lot. Um, so this is definitely a highly advanced clinic. And when we talk about um, uh, complexity in terms of clinical revenue, uh, there's there's different levels. We call it level billing of um, of one through five. And specifically, we're talking about not some sort of procedure or some sort of operation in in uh, an operating room, but really when the doctor is sitting down with you one-on-one -on -one and talking about some of the things that you're experiencing or been through or a follow-up after a procedure. And when we talk about level billing, uh, there's level one through five and level one is um, is the easiest, super, super short. Um, um, level one billing happens um, um, a lot of times in the inpatient uh, uh, setting where it's some doctor just coming in to check on you, see how you're doing. It doesn't last very long, five, 10, 15 minutes, really, really quick. Um, level five is extremely complex. So when we talk about level five billing is we're talking about multiple complex problems problems, a deep family and genetic history, several high, high risk factors. And the important thing to know about the difference between level one and level five billing is that when we go to the payers or insurance companies is they pay us different amounts of money for level one versus level five. And of course, level five drives higher revenue and level one drives less revenue. Another important background uh, note here is to talk about provider notes and templates. So you're sitting down with a provider in the superhero clinic and they're talking with you, talking about uh, talking about your current situation and the things that you're experiencing. And um, they're taking notes. They're taking notes on everything that you say. They're taking, they're, they might make a new diagnosis. They might make a new uh, recommendation. They might refer you to go see, see another specialist or another subspecialist. And all of that is, is really literally almost in a note. We call these templates or or, uh, and um, a lot of times they're blank, but one of the things we have the ability to do is based off a certain situation, create specific templates and create specific prompts for the provider. And those prompts could be, um, hey, does your family have a history of X, Y, Z? Uh, tell me a little bit about this or a little bit about that is just these, this ability to help our providers hit a lot of the key points that could determine something or that could determine the difference between a level four or a level five bill in terms of complexity. 
The last important note here is to talk a little bit about payer mix. So what is payer mix? Of course, our providers see a lot of different patients from a lot of different settings with a lot of different insurance companies. Different insurance companies, they pay different amounts. And when we look at clinical revenue, this is always a consideration. The main reason is, is because it's possible to up your patients by 10%. So theoretically, your revenue should increase by 10% too. But if your payer mix changes, if you have higher Medicare, Medicaid, different payers, Payers, um, you could actually lose money in doing something like that. So we also look at payer mix, and that's the, the general term for that as well. All right, so the stage is set. Uh, uh, now let's talk about a little bit about the problem with this particular clinic. So in one of our advanced clinics, um, we adjusted the epic the EPIC templates, so the notes that these providers are writing to ensure more accurate and more precise billing. Um, uh, we looked at uh, uh, our prescriptive data and we compared that to national averages. And on the level billing, our providers were billing really, really low for their overall subspecialty. Specifically, they were averaging 3.5 and four level billings, where on a national scale, a lot of the providers were all averaging closer to almost exclusively level, level five. Um, and of course, what that means is, is being a division administrator and a penny pincher here is, is we're looking at this thinking, you know what, we feel like we could be losing a little bit of money. Um, all right. Um, so with that in mind is, um, is we made a change. We made a change to these EPIC templates. We uh, uh, created certain prompts where the different coders, when they would review these notes, that they would jump in and say, you know what, this is a level five bill because it checks off A, B, C, D, and E done, and we can get this thing moving. So with that in mind is, is when we made this change to our EPIC templates or to our, our, our templates, what actually happened? Did our clinical revenue increase? How are providers billing now? All right, so now enter the Tableau dashboard that I created here. And just to walk you through this a little bit, just a moment, let me move my little zoom bar, is this is broken down into a couple of different parts. And as you can see, we have the superhero clinic. This is our revenue analysis. And starting at the top, so um, in fiscal year 2020, our net income based off of um, what we call ENM coding, these specific clinic visits, our overall income was 1.9. Um, overall income in fiscal year 21 was 2.2 million. So an, a growth of 276,000 over a quarter million dollars, which for us was a 13.5% a, a increase. That's huge. That's a, a big jump in clinical revenue. It's even bigger um, considering that we actually lost one of our providers. So essentially, um, Spider-Man here, he was a part of the overall billing in fiscal year 2020. We lost a provider and even with, with Spider-Man leaving is we still had an increase of 13% in clinical revenue. So instantly that tells us is that this overall change in, the, uh, in our Epic templates made some sort of difference. Coming down to the second section here, this is broken down to a percentage basis, and this is level one, two, three, four, and five. The black bar is fiscal year 2020, and the gold bar <clears throat> is fiscal year 2021. And sure enough, what do we see is we see a big jump from um, level four billings that in 2020 comprised 32% of all of our billings, that dropped to 25%. And we had basically the inverse relationship happen with level five billings. In fiscal year 2020, it was 25%, and in 2021, it was 33%. Again, a huge indicator of, oh my gosh, this had a big, um, um, that this jump in clinical income had a lot to do with this shift in, in, in our overall EPIC templates. This next section here is all of these visualizations are meant to really be tied together. And what do we have? The first thing we have is we have the average level per person. So for all of these superheroes, is their overall average for all of their patients um, um, is averaged in these tables. And you can see that I put this in a heat map, and then I sorted this table by fiscal year 21. So we can see that Dr. Strange is billing at the highest level at 4.8, and Iron Man down here is billing at the lowest level of 3.8, so almost a full point average below. And this was really, really helpful for us because the first thing that we can see is we can see any sort of patterns from fiscal year 2020 to 2021. Specifically, Captain America here, we can see that Captain America had a huge increase in their overall uh, level of billing, where they were the lowest billing provider to, to about the mid-range. 
And also because the way it's sorted is we can also see the Iron Man as mentioned below is feeling a little is feeling lower. And then this is also accompanied by this overall level percentage over here. And as mentioned before, the payer mix. Now, a little spoiler alert, the payer mix in this particular visualization doesn't really um, um, change that much, um, which is a good sign. Nevertheless, as mentioned before, it's an important data point to consider. So we know that our clinical revenue isn't being driven up or down by some sort of big change in our payer mix. One of the cool things that you can do with this visualization is we can click on any of these superheroes and what will happen, um, bear with me here, is all is these visualizations up here will change. The 322, the center of the donut, is the number of patients they saw. And over here, we can quickly see the overall percentage um, for this provider over the fiscal year 2020 and 2021. And we can also see their overall payer mix. Further, if I want to get down into details, I can click on a specific cell. And then the, those visualizations will also update with just this provider for just this fiscal year. So this made this report really, really dynamic where we can get down to the individual provider um, really, really quickly. With that in mind, the last visual down here is the overall revenue by fiscal year. And um, um, what do we see is that in fiscal year 2020, the overall average revenue between both our MDs and APPs, an APP is an advanced practice provider, largely an NP or a PA um, that might see somebody in this clinic, is that we did see a significant jump in overall clinical revenue from an average of 164 per month to an average of 187 per month. Further, when we made this change to our Epic template, is that took place in January. And it's very typical for for our payers and bills to come in about two months later. And of course, what we see is two months later, a massive increase in overall clinical revenue. Um, um, and that continues, that stays at a high level for the rest of the year. So this is immediately telling us is that this change in Epic templates um, um, really did a lot of really, really great things in terms of driving revenue. Some other cool features about this dashboard is, is that with these filters, we can click quickly filter down from, um, um, from everybody to exclusively our APPs. And this is also interesting because we can see up here that all of these visuals change just for the APPs. So here's our four APPs. And we can see that they're really driving this change and they've driven about, or they've had about an 18.8% increase in clinical revenue based off of, off of this change in, uh, in templates. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can also filter this from, uh, um, um, from just outpatient to telemedicine or inpatient as well. We can see our MDs, they're lagging behind our APPs a little bit. We can also focus on um, new or returning um, returning patients because we get different levels of funding for whether or not the patient is new or returning. So having that said, is this is the overall visualization um, I mean, some of the, the, the dynamic way that we can work with it. And one of the things that we've done with this is we've talked to go, gone to some of these providers like Iron Man and said, hey, let us help you with your billing. What's going on? Why do you tend to bill so low compared to the overall net average? They're almost a half point below the overall net average. What's going on and how can we um, help support this provider in that way, shape, or form? So this is the overall visualization. Let me jump back to my presentation here and we're going to uh, and I have a couple of other things to, to show you. Just a moment. Um, Okay, so um, I already talked through some of these things is, is um, we compared revenue over the past two years for this visualization, we compared level one through five billion over the past two years, we were able to break this, we were able to include the payer mix, we were able to drill down to the per provider level. And um, um, as we already saw, we already took a look at that dashboard, but let's talk about some of the cool factors about this. What really makes this cool and unique is it's not just, it's more a little bit more than um, just a fun dashboard, but um, one of the cool things is it's super easy to update. It only takes me about five minutes to update um, for the next month, and then I can get it out to our providers. Now, per Tavio's presentation, maybe I can drop that to zero minutes and just have it update all the time. Uh, one of the other cool factors is, although it's not necessarily obvious, is that this links two different data sources together. So when we start talking about data and visualizations, I always like to think of it like an iceberg, as in the dashboard is literally the tip of the iceberg, but 80% of the work happens below it with the actual data and the data structure. And one of the things that's not necessarily as obvious is this is actually coming from two different data sources. So when we start talking about clinical 
revenue is we have um, two different SAS cubes we're pulling this information from. The first one is, is, is um, clinical revenue, is the net clinical revenue that's posted for the given month. That comes from what I'm gonna call an accounting cube or this AX cube right here. The other side of it, when we start talking about the levels of billing, the uh, work RVUs, the payer mix, a lot of that other data and information, that comes from a clinical revenue cube, which is entirely different than the actual revenue that ends up getting posted. And that comes from a different cube. It's called MyBI. I won't get into that too much. And one of the cool things is courtesy of Tableau's most recent or one of their most recent updates is I was able to link both of these cubes together via the employee ID to really make this not only dynamic, but to build it really, really fast. And it's funny because I came to this Tableau users group about, um, about a a year ago, and that's when there was a presenter that talked about uh, data relationships in Tableau. And let's take a look under the hood really fast here. Um, and usually what I use to combine this data is I use something like Tableau Prep. It doesn't take that long. I love Tableau Prep. It's a fast tool. But to be able to pull in all of these different data points, it probably would have taken me about a good two or three hours straight to really build that into, um, into a flat file that could really function at the same level. However, um, after coming to this group and learning more about how relationships worked, is I was able to just do a quick relationship between the H or between our overall the accounting cube, our, our income, and the um, and our revenue cycle as well. And there's a couple of other connections here, um, all using relationships. And I did that in just a few quick minutes. As I did that in two or three minutes, and instantly I was ready to move and I was ready to build these vis visualizations because those relationships were established, it made it really, really easy, coming back over here, let me put this in presentation mode, is when you look at these different filters to have data points like the clinical income for fiscal year 20 and 21, to have that update based off of these different filters coming from one cube, and at the same time have the level percentage, the payer mix, as well as the level percentage by fiscal year update is coming from the other cube. Um, so that's really what makes this cool, this particular dashboard cool is the ability to blend those data sources together and make them dynamic and to be able to do it super, super fast. Um, my last really huge win with this um, um, dashboard was that the first time I presented it to one of our clinical providers is, is this clinician, this MD. Um, um, we started going through it. We started diving into the data. We started looking into it. Um, and then after I left the meeting, he was sending me screenshots of his different filters that he was putting on, pointing out different insights. So I feel like for us as designers and data visualization um, um, stars and experts is for me, that's always the ultimate goal is when our users who are not incredibly always super tech savvy, in this case, this person wasn't, um, when they start sending you screenshots of filtered data with their own takeaways on what's going on, is that that's a huge win. Um, and that was one of the things that for me made this dashboard really, really exciting and really, really useful is that it wasn't one of those that you create and nobody looks at. It is something that people will use on an ongoing basis to help drive decisions. All right. So in summary, um, that is my presentations. And I wanted to open it up to the group to ask um, for any questions, insights, or any critiques that you guys might have. No critiques. Your dashboard was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> It's that peace and calming when you open it up and there's space, yeah. there's breathing space, things are organized, consistent color palette, a lot of those design best practices, um, it looked like you had incorporated into your dashboard. <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, um, and the other cool thing about it is there's a lot of data on it too. I mean, overall, I think I was able to load six, seven different visualizations, but keeping it clean, keeping it pleasant, hopefully welcoming to people. Like that I want I want my dashboards to say, hey, come play with me, um, 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 interact with me um, um, and let's have some fun together. I don't want them to be like, oh, I don't want to touch this because I'm going <laughs> to like break something and it's scary. It's awesome. So again, if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat or the, uh, the Q&A box um, while we're waiting for people to type something in. Can you talk about um, as you release and launch this dashboard, how you are uh, communicating that to the end user, training them on how to use 
What format do you request feedback? How do you uh, keep it? Um, it? What's your process for evolution? Because no dashboard, right, stays the same from the, the moment of inception. So if you could just kind of talk briefly around that. Yeah, fantastic question. So with the main section head of this particular clinic is that I do have regular one-on-one -on -one meetings with this person about once a month. So of course that makes it a really, really great and easy place to be to able to ask for feedback, to dive into the data, to talk about it. Um, um, like I said, is my, my updating process isn't cool and snazzy compared to what Tavio is doing. But usually what happens is as soon as I update, as soon as a different data source is closed for the for the prior month is that I'll just refresh everything and then then issue a new link to the given provider um, um, and then when we meet at, meet one on one we'll talk about it we'll talk about the different changes I think the other thing is a lot of times people don't know what they want to change with it so one of my tricks is 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 I is I propose um, new methods of consuming the data specifically most recently I, I was looked at this section head and I I was like, hey, would you be interested in like a mobile version? What if we created a mobile app that had a lot of the same data and information? He's like, yeah, I'm really curious to see how that would look. Um, and that kind of gives me the motive to create something, you know, I mean, on a mobile version, I'm not going to be able to load six different visualizations on a, like a tiny little screen. So that's going to spark a little bit of innovation. It's going to spark a little bit of change and it's going to spark that iterative process. Um, maybe through there, we come up with a better way to visualize those average tables. I hate tables. They're so square. Um, 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 but maybe there's a better way to do that. And maybe through the mobile version, okay, we change it to something else. And then that ends up getting translated back to the overall kind of desktop version. And we can really keep this going. Um, to that end, the other thing that I'll say to that too is the other hard thing is that, of course, whenever you show data, what do people want? They want more data. So then the question becomes is how can I parse this out in a good, reasonable way that gets the information they need but isn't overwhelming? It's still welcoming. It still um, invites the user to really explore it in different ways. Um, I have another question for you. <laughs> What do you find um, is some of your best resources for uh, design inspiration, for um, staying kind of on top of your game with new skills? So just as far as a professional development lens with this tool, any yeah. recommendations? Absolutely. Um, um, with that in mind, I'm sure many of you guys subscribe to the Tableau uh, Viz of the Day. I love getting those emails. I love looking at those dashboards. I think that those are really inspiring. By the way, this didn't mean to translate into like a Tableau, like, you know, a, a selling point. But to that end is I also love watching the Iron Viz competitions is those are so good and so creative. And they do a lot of really cool stuff. The other thing that I have here, and sorry, I'm looking, I have a book shelf in my in the corner of my office here and I'm looking to see if I can have one but one of my favorite ones to look at is um is I look at um it's 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 a book issued by Tableau it's only like 30 pages long it's called art it's called art in data. I like to think of myself as an artist when I approach these different things. And so with that in mind is I'll flip through that when I really need some sort of level of inspiration. I'll say my number one trick is um, um, I do, I went to, I think, um, um, where did I go? I went to like a Michaels or something and I got this really, really cool, fun, artistic notebook. And this is where a lot of my visualizations start. I have some colored pencils nearby and when I start talking about this data with these different providers is the first mock-ups are always, I always just draw them out, right? Begin with the end in mind. And I'm trying to find one of the original colors for these ones, one of the original ones, but it's like, oh, I can't see it very well. But it basically goes through a lot of the different elements and the things that I want to draw. Um, my last, my last thing, Stephanie, sorry, you, you got more than what you bargained for for this question, is I feel like in dashboard visualizations, the number one underutilized thing, I'm going to jump back to my dashboard, is circles. I think that we don't have enough curves and circles and round edges on things. And truly, in the terms of this dashboard, 
is I intentionally incorporated two donuts because this is a very, very, very square. This is very, very square. This is very, very square. But this does a couple of things for us. It breaks up the visualization overall and it kind of forces your mind to look at it differently. It also creates a lot of white space as well. And I feel like that I always love seeing dashboards with curves, with circles, with different round type things. And I'm always, this is just me, but I'm always less attracted to the ones that are just like block, 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 is I want that kind of those curves to really, I don't know, change the way that I look at it in some way, shape or form. Yeah, I feel like you and I need a partner um, in one of the future sessions to do a design best practice uh, workshop. <laughs> during I'm in. All oh, right. Done. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Um, looks like we just have some kudos and thank yous um, popping up on here. So. I appreciate your time and the, the energy that you put into this presentation, um, the superhero of the day here. Um, so I will go ahead and take back sharing again. We're coming to our close of our meeting. So for those still on the meeting, um, say thanks for sticking with us. So this is just a reminder. We have uh, TC22 uh, that's coming up next month. Um, we or um, I went ahead and did some screen grabs here. Uh, the conference is May 17th, 18th, and 19th. Um, they're uh, continuing to post information out on the website. So if you just go to tableau.com um, slash events, I can put the, the link here in this. Actually, I have it up on my screen. Let me just grab it rather than just talk about it. Let me put it in the chat. Um, the, or they're doing a hybrid event this year, um, and so there will be, I think, 5,000 uh, spaces for in-person, and then there's also some virtual sessions as well. So take a look at that. Uh, last I saw, um, they're, they're going to post in May some of the different breakout sessions. So if you're going in person, um, that's the latest I saw. Adam bringing one of the reps here on the call. Still some spots available, but not many. So yeah, pretty exciting. Um, there, so I'm going to just cruise through these. There's day one, right? So there's in-person and virtual. Uh, day two, um, the 18th, same thing, in-person and virtual. The Iron Viz is on May 18th, so make sure you block that out. Stephen uh, just kind of alluded to that. That is an amazing um, uh, block there. And then day three is just in-person only. So just to kind of let you know um, that piece. Um, I ask that if you are going uh, to let me know, we like to coordinate some events um, for those on site. So it will be um, exciting to, to see here. Um, and I'm just going to do a quick plug. Um, I help facilitate this meeting. Uh, Plant Moran allows me to take time out of my day. Um, oh, it just flips. There must be a timer on it. Time out of the day uh, to, to help support. So we offer a myriad of services to helping you with your data in your BI platform, helping you think through strategy. So if you hear of a buzz in your organization or an RFP hitting the street um, before it's launched, if you'll give me a heads up, that'd be greatly appreciated. But uh, my contact information is here as well as Lauren, uh, Jamie and Carissa's will get Adam on there as well. Uh, going forward since he does support all of the education clients here in Colorado. Um, the, the session is recorded. We'll get a link um, from Tableau here in a couple days. I will send out an email. Tavio did send his presentation material to me already. So Stephen, if you have anything to share, um, let me know and I will incorporate that into um, the, the meeting that goes or the email that goes out to all of those who joined us today. So we are wrapped up a few minutes early, give you back 15 minutes of your day, um, but we appreciate uh, Stephen and Tavio for presenting for us today, willing to share content, great ideas um, in supporting this user group. Um, hopefully we'll have some more participation going forward. We've had some hiccups over the last couple of months. I think right state agencies were just overwhelmed. It became a little bit hard <laughs> during the, the pandemic. And so as we all start to get into um, a new sense of normal, um, we're hoping that we can have these user group meetings on more of a regular cadence. But again, that goes back to having presenters um, volunteer um, and topics can be a demonstration of dash dashboards like you saw today, the use case stories behind it, some tips and tricks uh, like Tavio presented 
Um, so any of those things um, are welcomed um, here at this user group. So again, reach out if you have uh, some great ideas, suggestions, and you want to participate going forward. Um, but I will go ahead and take it as a close. But thank you all for joining us today, and uh, we'll see you next time.